science, the pursuit of knowledge about the physical world through observation and experimentation, looking for answers to the what, how, and when questions. Science has the capacity to open doors, to ask questions, and some of the tools to begin to answer those questions. Answers always lead to more questions. Religion, the pursuit of meaning and purpose through a belief in God, looking for answers to the why questions. Religious faith can address some of these questions of purpose and meaning. Why are we here? Is there a God? What does God want for our lives? both seeking answers using different methods to different questions. This past century has seen the two worlds in direct opposition, but it wasn't always the case. If you think about the early scientists, great scientists like Newton and Boyle and Kepler and Galileo and, and on and on, these people were Christian believers. I think scientists, like people of faith, are on a quest for truth. Scientists are often trying to understand natural processes and how they work, whereas people of faith are often asking questions about why, what is the ultimate purpose of creation in the world that we see. A recent study from Rice University that surveyed 275 scientists from 21 universities concluded that 85% of the scientists interviewed believed that religion and science were never, or only sometimes, in conflict. I believe that there's no uh, intrinsic need for there to be some discord between religious faith and science. We have to keep in mind that today, science, what we call science and what we call religious faith, typically address different kinds of questions. And to be a kind of whole person, you need to address all these kinds of questions in your life. It's such a travesty that we've acceded to the kinds of mythology that somehow science and Christianity are inevitably at war with one another and that that warfare is, has always existed. This is not true. Part of understanding the world is part of my worship. It's part of being with God and God's creation. That's all the same thing to me. And so uh, uncovering how the universe works or uncovering how a plant grows or an animal grows is, is all the same. It's, it's understanding what this world is and the, and the Lord that created it. The two are together. This is why I have no conflict with faith and science. I invite my God into my science all the time. I say, Lord, you know the answers. I don't. Lord, give me creativity. What distinguishes me as a scientist? You know, Greg Boyd, an author and pastor, uh, I believe he's in Minneapolis, Minnesota, he's, he talks about certainty faith. Mm. And I think I grew up with a little bit of that certainty faith. I had an idea of what the world and um, and God's creation looked like, and I, I put it in my own mind, and so I was afraid to maybe challenge that with science, because what if it didn't turn out like I thought? And throughout history, there's been great scientists who were devout Christians, and I didn't know that. Yeah. People like Isaac Newton, Francis Bacon, Johann Kepler, Blaise Pascal. You know, Albert Einstein was quoted saying, science without religion is lame, and religion without science is blind. Hmm. For some in today's world, this statement would be ludicrous. Yeah. It's a pretty bold statement. Well, and I think there's still people that see that there's this disconnect, and mm -hmm. we see a lot of debate still about that. And so even having this conversation can be kind of revolutionary yeah, for some people right. watching, thinking that we're, you know, kind of stepping outside <laughs> the box. But I think, again, there is this way, how do we go back to the core and, and how this whole idea started when we think about um, all of these great scientists who had a faith, and we see these clips mm -hmm. now, of so many scientists who still have this faith. You know, there was a recent conference where Christian scientists got together and said, how do we actually stand for this and speak up even more? That there is a role for mm. faith and science to for play sure. together. Well, the Bible starts with it. He gives us mm. this, this account of creation and in, uh, you know, in the way they could back then. He was given us a scientific account of how creation started. We're gonna be talking about creation in a little bit, but we, uh, well, we have more for you on science and faith. Take a look at this. You know, 15 minutes, you know, add some water, and that should get rid of a lot of the salt. For James Tour, the journey to becoming a distinguished chemist and world-renowned researcher in nanotechnology was an unusual one. I wanted to become a New York State trooper and 
I couldn't get into the academy because I was colorblind. What I did is I set out to go into forensic science and my father said, why don't you just study chemistry in general and you could specialize after, after that, which was good advice. After graduating and working as an assistant professor, James made an incredible breakthrough in molecular electronics. It came after reading an article in a science journal. In that article, there was a molecule that was uh, built as a, as a perpendicular type of structure. And it came out of IBM, and they said that this could be a switching device if anybody could make it. So I thought it would be a good, a, a good thing to practice making, and so we, we ended up making it. And then I was contacted by Scientific American, and they said, uh, we've learned that you've just made the, the most difficult molecule ever synthesized. But I realized that if we took our tools of organic synthesis and moved into other areas where they were not familiar with synthesis, we could have a huge impact. It was this outstanding achievement that eventually led him to Rice University, now a professor of chemistry, computer science, mechanical engineering, and material science at the Smalley Institute for Nanoscale Science. James' research in nanotechnology is equally groundbreaking. What we're doing is we're programming molecular computers. That was a project that we were involved in, and that we try to understand the chemistry that goes on in the actual hardware, the switches. For example, we have an area in nano machines where we build nano cars, where we can park 50,000 of these across the diameter of a human hair. So they're very, very small. They're about two nanometers by three nanometers. But these are the size structures, the size domains that we can begin to consider. And then we try to monitor and watch these move across a surface, learn how to pick things up and move them, because ultimately what's done is if you want to do bottom-up construction, uh, much like, like is done in all of biological systems. Everything is done from the bottom up. This is the way that God has decided to construct things. In 100 years or 200 years, we'll see buildings built this way, where we'll just bring in basic raw materials and little nanomachines will begin to build a structure and you'll see it go up just as, as, as blades of grass grow, the structure will, will assemble. Okay, and so these are hollow? Yes. And what do you want to do with this? Among the numerous applications derived from the work of James and his research team is the creation of carbon nano vectors for medical treatments. So we have these nanoparticles that we call hydrophilic carbon clusters. And what these can do is we can target them to certain cell types using typical targeting schemes. So it can go and find the cell of interest if you wanted to go to a cancer cell, for example. But in the face of trauma, a superoxide forms in excess and it starts attacking good tissue. So what we do is we, we made these carbon nanoparticles that will react with that superoxide and decompose the superoxide. And so that's what it was designed for and it, it actually works quite well. In addition to this, James has had over 350 research papers published in academic journals, becoming one of the top 10 cited authors in the world since 2000. For all his success, he keeps dreaming of more. I'd love to see some of the medications, the nanomaterials that we're using for, for medicine be ultimately used uh, to benefit people. We have projects related to pancreatic cancer and different cancer types, and, and uh, I see people suffering from that. I'd like to, to see that used. But the best treasure we have, it's like in any field, the best thing that we have is, is the people. It's, it's the, the people that we work with and seeing them go out because that's what will really outlast me as we train these students and see them go forward. Wow, the next generation mm -hmm. of scientists. So I have a question for you. Okay. Uh, for generations, Christians have taken the creation story to be a literal six days. How do Christians today reconcile their faith in scientific evidence of an old earth? What do you think about that? This is the way I look at it. I, first of all, I know I'm not bright enough to even get into the conversation. Whether it was the literal six days or whether it was way longer than we think, I've come to this conclusion. I believe with everything in me 
that God was the creator. Mm. And then I don't have to get involved in the debate because I don't understand it. It's yeah. too complicated for and, me. And you know what? There are pastors and theologians on both sides totally. of this debate. You know, I love the scripture in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. It says, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. And so again, we don't know, as you've you know, said, we don't know how long it took, no. but at the end of the day, we know that it was created and God sat back and said, it is good. I take a lot of trust in the fact that God was involved. Mm. Like many scientists who have faith in God, Dr. James Tour has to, had to deal with some challenging theological questions. Questions like the origins of life. Take a look at this. I think the evidence leads to a big bang to an event that occurred something on the order of, of 13 billion years ago, think that's where the evidence leads. The Bible clearly tells us also that God created the heavens and the earth, that there was an event that happened. It was not always. It happened at a certain time where God created it. The bigger question is, what is the origin of life from a scientific perspective? There's very few people that understand molecular interaction better than I do. And for me, I cannot fathom how the origin of life took place. It's a much harder question than, than everything else that we might try to answer. God's love is like a fire. When it ignites and when it spreads, it can transform anyone. I called 100 Huntley Street the prayer line and that was a real turning point in my salvation. We serve a God who can take the ashes, the broken pieces of our life, and he can make something beautiful. So I said, hmm. God, if you're this real, I will do anything that you want me to do. God's love story can inspire anyone to make a difference in the lives of people around the world. We are very sure, we are very optimistic about our future because we know we will plant, we will have water to drink. You become influential by setting a new pace. The gospel is timeless. Every single person has a story, but we're all part of God's greater story, which is the greatest story of all. You know, we are so grateful that we get to tell stories like this and give perspectives of faith. And if you want to keep shows like this on the air, we want you to partner with us. Uh, you can call 1-800-265-3100 or go to 100huntley.com and, and partner with us and, and help us keep spreading the message of faith throughout the airwaves. Well, let's head back to science and, yeah, faith. science and faith. Finding a balance between science and faith can sometimes be tough. But the most important thing to know is that there is a God that loves and wants to be in relationship with you. Jim Tour is perhaps the most intense person I have ever known. He's intense about chemistry. He's intense about his family. He's intense about his research. He's intense about his students. He's intense about working out. Uh, everything with him is like 100%. The intensity begins at 3.30 a.m. each morning as James spends two hours reading his Bible and praying before heading out to the gym for his 90-minute workout. It's a regiment that has been his life for more than 30 years. But it wasn't always this way. Growing up in a secular Jewish home, James never gave God a second thought. It wasn't until his college years that a conversation with a young man about the Bible changed the course of his life. So then he showed me a verse where Jesus said, if you look at a woman with lust for her, you've committed adultery with her already in your heart. And I was deeply convicted by that. I was addicted to pornography. I was only 18 years old at the time. And then he showed me other verses where Jesus died for my sins. I didn't even know that there was a claim on the table that Jesus died for me. That was not something that we discussed. And then he 
talked about how I can get to God through this man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for me. A few months later, after studying the Bible, James made an important decision. On November 7th, 1977, I was all alone in my room. And I got down on my knees and I asked the Lord to forgive me and to come into my life. And all of a sudden, this burden that I had been carrying since the young man shared with me about my sin just started to lift. And I felt the presence of God so strongly filling the room. His presence was so vivid and I was being drawn and I didn't want to get up and I just started weeping. The experience left him deeply changed. James soon joined a nearby church. It was here that he met his future wife at a potluck supper. Went in to do the dishes and she was already doing them. My heart just leapt out of my chest. It was just started pounding like Popeye. So I just stood there and dried the dishes that she was doing. And then I started to notice how beautiful she was and how gracious she was. Married now for 31 years and parents of four children, ages 17 to 29, they have modeled a strong faith in God. I wake up very early in the morning, kneeling at the bottom of the steps, reading my Bible, and the Lord speaks to me through the scriptures. I learned so much about how to gauge my life, how to work with people, how to respect people, how to honor things, and how to do what is right. Like many couples, James and Shireen have overcome struggles in their relationship, but their love and commitment to each other has withstood the test. Then they go up one more step and they read Psalm 122. You know, people just see him as an intense person working very hard, but he has a very tender heart. <laughs> Even when big things hit, you can just see her. She's just going to go back to the Lord. And she opens up her Bible, which is underlined everywhere, everywhere. And just, she is a rock, an absolute rock. And that deep faith has led them to open their home to many each week for meals and conversation. They have helped connect university students into the life of the church. They've challenged them to serve the body of Christ. Uh, they literally feed, have everyone to their home on Sunday afternoons for special lunches. If you're a young person and you're there to feel loved or be at a home, especially for these lunches, he just knows how to reach out to young people specifically and make them feel loved and wanted. James lives out his faith in every aspect of his life. It's a personal relationship where I'm bringing God into my work. Show me what you got, Abdul. And I break at noontime and I pray over each of my projects and I pray over each of the students. I have a list of the, the students on my smartphone and I just pray for each one working in the lab and their projects. Revolutionizing the world with his research in nanotechnology isn't the only legacy James is leaving. He is so involved in God's Word. He, he meditates on it, he studies it, he reads it. He doesn't use any helps. He just does it on his own and asks God to show him what he wants him to know. And that has really rubbed off on me. He's humble, and if you have any questions about the Bible, the scriptures, I think he's the right person to come and ask. I love his discipline. I love his commitment. And, and he knows that the first thing in his life is his relationship with God. That's number one. And it comes out very clear. We all work extremely hard. Our hours are very long. I'll get emails from Jim in the middle of the night. But when it's dinner time and he's meeting with his family, basically meetings are over and he goes home. And I think that's just a uh, fantastic quality that he has. We deal with a lot of cancer patients that we'd like to help. He would just go get on his knees at the in the hospital. He'd just sit there and just cry and pray over them. Uh, I don't have many goals, but I have a few. 
and I have a goal to share Jesus Christ with many people around me and impact them for Jesus. You know, you may be watching this and you saw that story, you saw that great story of redemption. That may not be your story, but your story is important. And you may be, you may be sitting there struggling going, God, I don't know about this God thing, or science, I, I, don't know how to, I don't know how to rationalize all that I know, but here's what I do know. If you're thinking about science and faith, there's probably a God that wants to talk to you, and it's a good sign. We want to encourage you. If you've got questions about faith and science and how they coexist, call our prayer lines. There's people that want to talk to you. They want to tell you about what they know and the peace that they found in Jesus Christ. one 866 273-4444, give us a call. We want to start that conversation. And I love this conversation because again, we're, we always hear that there are two separate camps. Mm -hmm. And I love the fact that we're giving you a little taste of a, a greater documentary called Science and Faith that was produced here at Crossroads that you can get your hands on. Just go to 100huntley.com and click on our e-store link and uh, you can access that video there and purchase it. But again, delving into these mm -hmm. topics that we need to and, and understanding that maybe there isn't as much of a division as we think there is. That there's room for bo both as we saw with James Tour's story that even a great scientist like that could find solace yeah. in God and know that there are answers in the Bible and how do we reconcile both of those worlds. And it's okay to have questions. Absolutely. It's okay to say, this doesn't make sense. Help me figure it out. Absolutely. God is not afraid of our questions. <laughs> Science shouldn't be afraid of our questions. If you've got questions, ask them, find out, talk to people about this. Mm -hmm. Start a conversation about Jesus, about science and how this all works. I think you'll be surprised at the answers you get. Mm. And I think you made a great point earlier on in, in the show, Kevin, at the end of the day, no matter mm -hmm. you know what the debate is, we know that God is our creator. We know that we are his product, that we have been created by him. And, uh, and you know, people devote their lives to mm -hmm. trying to figure this out. And we love that through scientific research, we have found cures for diseases. Yep. And so we, uh, we honor that capacity to do that. But at the end of the day, I think a lot of scientists would say that they know that there is a creator. Yep. And, uh, and so we honor that. And you know, I get to the place where I say, I believe God is the creator of everything. And Newsboys want to bring you a great song as we close here. This is We Believe. In my lifetime, I've encountered what most of you have experienced, loss, disappointment, struggles, pain. But in all of it, I have learned to be a joyful person because I've had a very special uh, teacher. I invite you to come along with me on a journey, a journey into joy may seem like a mirage to some of you, but I assure you, joy is within reach. When we follow the teacher who gave us a very extended message in the Gospel of Matthew, chapters 5, 6, and 7, there he led us into joy. The great principles that produce joy, contentment within our lives, you can find that joy. Take the first step and journey into joy with David Maines by ordering this book. Call 1-800-265-3100 or order online at crossroads.ca. This book is our thanks to you for your generous support of Crossroads Life Changing Media.